And given that Gandhi was from Gujarat, we thought it was appropriate that we have uh, a well-known feminist from Gujarat to help us light the lamp in memory of Gandhi. Okay, but anyway, to say Gandhi was from Gujarat would be really limiting his uh, persona, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think here is, it seems strange to do this with a lighter because one always otherwise Does, lights a cigarette with a lighter. Does anyone no. have a match? No? Okay. Here. Okay. Do you want me to do it for you? Oh. Why don't you know? Okay. Here so we this go. is just to <laughs> spread the the light of peace. All right. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. I just want to thank Meta for uh, having me speak tonight, and uh, certainly when I speak, I think I'm speaking for many women and men in India who participated in some of the work I'm going to talk about. I want to uh, welcome you all and uh, we're going to have uh, a bit of a discussion and then a short film and then we'll continue with the discussion to understand the topic of tonight which is nonviolence as political action. Um, so Today's presentation, I'm going to introduce a nonviolent political action that was carried out in India in October 2012. Now, this is to ground our discussion tonight on nonviolence as a form of social action, of political action. Many people believe that political change can only be affected through violent means. And a common argument used is that nonviolence is ineffective against such things as genocide and dictatorships and so on. It is true that as long as people still think of politics as violent, then nonviolence doesn't look very convincing. Let us turn back, however, to this Indian example, because I think it shows how a large group of very marginalized poor people were able to, uh, who, who, who typify absolute marginalization and live daily violence, how they were able to adopt nonviolent action. The one political, one political act of nonviolence does not prove that nonviolent politics can be advanced, but it does provide more convincing evidence that nonviolence is a form of political action. Now, the way I'm going to structure the talk tonight is I'm going to first introduce the film, as I've mentioned, and then I'm going to let you see for yourself some of the march of 50,000 people in fighting for their land rights nonviolently. Afterwards, I'm going to break uh, the, the film after about five or ten minutes, and we're going to look at uh, three different uh, major points of discussion. First, we're going to look at the power of the people in the march. And an accompanying question with that is how uh, do we, uh, you know, what are some of the reasons that such a marginalized group of people would choose nonviolence over violence, especially when Gandhi says poverty is the greatest violence? They are in an environment of continual violence, so why would they choose it? So that's the first uh, point and question. The second point that we're going to look at is the youth leadership and some of the mobilization that we've done in uh, India in order to build this social movement. And the question that we're going to look at in terms of that youth leadership mobilization is how do these youth leaders sustain a nonviolent movement, particularly when the political space in India is shrinking? And thirdly, we're going to look at nonviolence uh, 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 as, a, uh, as a concept, and we're going to understand the question whether nonviolent culture can be achieved or whether, in fact, we just use nonviolent tactics. So then moving right along, um, I would like to describe this event. It took place 
on, in October 2nd, 2012, so 15 months ago. And it was run by an organization called Ektaparishat, which is a Hindi word for one or unity forum, a coming together of many, many small struggle groups into a unified movement, Ekta Parishad. Now this is a mass-based organization and it's a non-violent Gandhian organization and it's made up of uh, indigenous uh, people, uh, landless poor, Dalits, fisher folk, pastoral people, and very, very uh, marginalized, deprived communities. This uh, uh, movement, with a number of allies, organized a huge assembly in this, on the 2nd of October, which is Gandhi's birthday. And this assembly had 50,000 people. And this 50,000 people decided, following the assembly, that they would make a march of 350 kilometers to Delhi, a long march. In fact, they had decided over before coming to the assembly, but the government asked them at the assembly to please listen to their arguments, and if they found them convincing, that they should need not march to Delhi. The government of India was not keen to have this 50,000 people land up in the midst of Delhi, and also be, uh, have many others possibly join them on the way. Now, the the government representatives addressed the various land grievances that these people had in terms of land dispossession, in terms of their displacement, in terms of persistent landlessness. And of course, there had been a great deal of lobbying with the government for many years before this. So it was framed in a way that they could speak to the grievances in a very practical uh, way in terms of the current policies and laws. Now, after hearing this, the senior ministers departed from this Gwalior assembly, and a people's parliament took, took, uh, uh, began. And uh, within the space of about three hours, with a great deal of discussion, the, uh, the people in the assembly decided that they had heard enough of government promises, and that they really did not believe the statements of the minister, and they did decide that they would only accept a negotiated agreement from the government in writing, and then, uh, since the government was not prepared to give that at this time, they decided to march. So thereafter, the next day, October 3rd, uh, the, the, this very, very poor group of, of people uh, agricultural laborers, very poor landless women, they began to march. And the scheduled marching was one month. They were to eat, sleep, and walk on the national highway. In fact, it was well known before starting this march that there was only food stock available for 10 days. And that was if they ate once a day. Now, these people, having prepared for about three years for this action, had had an earthen urn in their homes and collected one rupee every day for three years and one handful of rice. And the reason they did that was they left the rice behind for their families to eat while they came on this one month march, and they brought the money to help them along the way. So they were well prepared and had very great expectations that they would somehow manage, in spite of these food shortages, to make it to Delhi. So now we are going to see this march. What you've seen is a historical non-violent march towards Delhi of 50,000 people. This probably was one of, is one of the largest non-violent marches in Indian history. 
The marchers, as you know, were poor agricultural labor, tribals, fisher folk, pastoral people, like the Roma people, and other very poor landless communities. Now, what is really interesting about it is that the people in this march, really, it was their march. They found a way to use their feet as a way to show their power, to bring visibility to themselves and to their situation. And when you're in a situation as an agricultural laboring woman, without political patronage, without money, and without muscle power, so to speak, you have no you don't have a lot of options. So what they did is they took the capacities which they had, which was the ability to walk. And I think what is interesting is that if you go to communities in India, you see that people walk 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers, easily a day to get water, to pick up fuel wood, to collect fodder resources. So for them, walking is part of their life. They may also, in, in those that inhabit forest areas, may only eat once a day. So this is the power that they have. Uh, they can sleep anywhere and, uh, you know, on the ground and so on. And so if you compare that to uh, uh, middle class folk who uh, also campaign and tend to use more intellectual power than physical prowess, they may find it extremely difficult to walk these 12 kilometers a day along the national highway, uh, on the northbound way, eating, sleeping, showering on the national highway. But these people didn't. And I think it shows the power that they have, the power, uh, what we might say, the power of the poor. It was a really disciplined walk. It was a march. It was a determined march. You know, after reaching what you, what you haven't fully seen in this film is that the government who left uh, on the first day and they could not convince the people went back to Delhi and the people started walking. And the government, senior cabinet minister, rushed back to Agra about a third of the way that, to Delhi in order to show that he had signed, would sign the agreement with them and negotiate a land reform agreement. This is because he wanted to contain this march and negotiate a 10-point agenda. I have to say that the Rural Development Minister, which you did see in the film, uh, did put together with a large team a 10-point agenda for a six month period that would be achieved. And what actually did happen uh, was that after six months, this uh, agenda was about 70% fulfilled. And when I say that, six months later, 2,000 of these representatives came to Delhi and evaluated for themselves whether that agenda had been reached and decided that it, that it had. So the agreement that was made on October 11th stipulated that they, it would reactivate a land reform legislation that had actually been passed in the 1950s in India. What had happened is that after independence, when uh, uh, the lawmakers decided that land needed to be redistrib redistributed, uh, they created a land reform agenda and a land reform set of laws which got passed in each of the state governments. Um, in the 1970s, again, land reform was uh, reactivated for greater rights to the tiller of the land. But as the new economic reform process that worked to liberalize the economy came in the 1990s, land reform went right off the table. So uh, this was an attempt to reactivate uh, the land reform agenda, 
which, uh, as you can imagine, was quite a historic feat. Now, one can conclude that, you know, uh, if these invisible mass of people could actually use nonviolence to push the government uh, to do such a thing, um, that we have to really understand uh, how they made that possible. Um, the, the question that we asked at the beginning is uh, what are the reasons that this group of people chose nonviolence over violence? Um, let me say that I think from my own understanding, not only do the uh, people who were part of this and the mass amount of uh, Indian poor, not only are they not helped by the Indian government, but there's great perception that the state actually hinders the opportunities for their development. So this was an occasion when they took their responsibility in their own hands. And I think that marks what you see here, the genuineness of this action. Um, the, um, the fact that the state usually exhibits uh, power through deterring or promoting violence as opposed to deterring and pro promoting nonviolence uh, is something that we need to take note of. You can appreciate that the, the government of India found it very difficult to handle a nonviolent march. They're much more accustomed to uh, understanding how to deal with uh, acts of violence. They have departments of defense and uh, departments of home ministry, the home uh, and uh, ministry. And uh, really, they don't have a department of peace. They don't have a way of really sitting down at a negotiating table with such a large mass of poor uh, uh, people. Now, one of the things that is very interesting is the government found it very difficult to sign visibly an agreement in front of or with 50,000 people because they were afraid that another social movement would come to them and again want an agreement. So this was quite unusual and I would say extremely exceptional. They must have seen that there was a need to negotiate a settlement with this, the, the segment of poor, not only because they're part of the vote banks, their vote banks, and there's the compelling reason of the national election, which is coming up in a couple of months from now, but also because it would look very, very poor if a liberal uh, uh, UPA coalition government did not uh, see visibly that they were working to support uh, the poor and downtrodden. It would have, of course, been easier for the government if the issue had been a social welfare issue. If uh, these marchers had come with a pension problem or uh, the, you know, the rural employment guarantee scheme and needed more money, then it would be easier for the government to have sat down with this group of people. But in fact, what this was about was about a structural issue, was about a very fundamental power issue and quite problematic for any government. Um, you can appreciate that in a small s country like India on the Indian subcontinent with 1.2 billion people that are primarily an agri agrarian society, with a very rapidly industrializing economy, it makes it very difficult to know how to deal with both the small scale agricultural interests and giving people land, as well as dealing with an influx of large foreign investment and many, many corporate entities who are looking to grab resources for basic, for producing uh, goods. And uh, so what you have is you have a standoff, eyeball to eyeball standoff between 
uh, uh, groups who are wanting to industrialize very rapidly and need land resources and a group of people who see land as their livelihood. Um, the government of India, like uh, many other Brit former British colonies, uh, has eminent domain over land. And so the, the real challenge after 1947 was to take you know, large land holding and break them down into smaller pieces. As I mentioned earlier, the first national land reform legislation was in 1955, and it was supposed to work to guarantee more equity in the society. And unfortunately, the, the abolition, there were four or five main components to this land reform, the abolition of the zamindar or landlord, the uh, sealing act, the rationalization of different tenure systems because there had been a large number of princely states and they all had different tenure systems, and the imposition of sealing laws. Now, many people don't know this, but in India, one landlord is not supposed to have more than 40 unirrigated acres of land. Uh, and if it's irrigated, 20 acres, where if you compare that to Brazil, uh, one landlord may have as much as 100,000 hectares. I know we have a Brazilian friend here who would probably be able to reconfirm some of these facts. And what is really uh, unfortunate is that at the time that this land sealing was put into effect, the land was not redistributed because the, the, the big landlords were also the parliamentarians, the legislators. And they decided that instead of giving the, their land up under the ceiling, they would put 20 acres under the wife's name, 20 acres under the son's name, 20 acres under the cow's name, 20 acres under the dog's name. And therefore, they would be able to keep their larger uh, piece of land. Without that excess land, land distribution was very poor. And if you compare India at, at the time of independence, and in the 50s with countries like South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, or Vietnam, many other countries were doing land redistribution and redistributing as much as 30 to 40% of their agricultural land. At the end of the day, up till now, India has been able to transfer 1.5% of its agricultural land. And therefore, uh, the lack of redistribution created a huge landless population, and that landless population has been fighting to get that land ever since. But the, the, uh, the need to organize and to make uh, 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 the Indian government listen to those demands is very, very challenging. With the in uh, liberalization, liberalizing of the economy and deregulation expanding markets and the dismantling of the rights to the tiller or agricultural labors in the early 90s uh, led to huge number of land conflicts. I, I think people are not aware uh, outside of India what kind of serious implication this has. There's a, a, a good example of uh, an incident that happened in West Bengal in 2007, so just about six years ago. Uh, West Bengal at that time was under a communist government, one of the most progressive governments in terms of land redistribution. And in fact, uh, when a corporation wanted to move into Nandigram, the West Bengal government found its police were shooting tribals as they were fleeing their lands on evening television news. And 14 tribal or Adivasis, as we call them in India, indigenous people were killed and hundreds were injured. So 
if this happens in the most progressive part of the country where actually there has been a significant land reform, you can see how capital penetration has gained huge momentum in India and the struggle over land has become so widespread and intense that it has led to a situation of a lot of violent groups in, in districts in India in 120 districts out of 660, I believe, uh, uh, 660 districts in India, 120 of them have insurgency movements which are uh, control large areas of those districts in order uh, to try to uh, 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 gain land for uh, tribal populations. So uh, the government has seen that there are these violent movements and they're much more at ease, unfortunately, with using uh, of, uh, state violence uh, to settle uh, or to bring law and order to these districts. And in terms of settling disputes like land issues, it's very hard to start a dialogue with them. And s when, you, when we found in uh, about a year back, we did a study and saw that there were 800 major land conflicts in the country, which is, uh, is a gross underestimation of the total number. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, one sees that uh, the situation definitely requires dialogue. Instead of trying to adjudicate and redress some of these 800 conflicts, uh, the government has passed a law which is called, uh, it started off being the land, uh, uh, revised Land Acquisition Act about four or five years ago, and then it's slowly, because of the grassroots pressure and these conflict, uh, these movements started to grow up around all of these conflicts. It, it is now called, it was just passed last year, the Right to Fair Compensation and Transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act, indicating that clearly there is uh, a serious need for compensation and transparency. So what we see is that in this case is there's structural violence around land conflicts that's extensive and serious. And the nonviolent movement which you saw is trying in contradistinction to the violent movements to get the government to dialogue. Now, let us explore for a moment uh, uh, how this is, is going on. The, the, uh, the issues that are being looked at are basically within the framework of a national land reform policy. And uh, the government has passed this policy uh, and it's, it's a good framework for now trying to get different state governments to both give housing plots to completely homeless people which are living on railway tracks under plastic sheets and have virtually no land and are migrant, which is about 40 million people. And then they're looking at providing small land plots, uh, in some cases, in, uh, uh, to uh, people who qualify. Now, this is at a very early stage, and uh, we're not really sure, as there's an ensuing election, whether all of this will have to be renegotiated after the election. But what is, uh, I, I think, important is that the government did open channels for dialogue because of this pressure. And uh, there is some sort of uh, framework that is now in process. And um, we hope that things will turn uh, uh, in, in a way where some land is distributed. Now, I want to say that in 2007, we had a march of 25,000 people and 1.2 million acres of forest land was given 
to Adivasi indigenous people. So there was some success after that. This one, we're hoping more for Dalit communities, non-Adivasi communities particularly to be benefited. Um, how, I, I know, now that we've seen something of the power of the people to get a dialogue going with the government of India and gaining some ground, let's look at the power of some of the youth leaders and again ask our second question, how do you sustain nonviolence uh, in social movements if and as if uh, uh, as the political space is shrinking. Now, nonviolent action is made possible uh, because of long term sustained training. I think what is really interesting about comparing some of the Western social movements with the, uh, the nonviolent movements that I'm describing in India is that they are prepared and not s spontaneous movements. Uh, they, they build, there's a, there's a very deliberate training process of leaders who go to training and then go as rural leaders and then go back to villages and start to organize people from the ground up. So just to give you an idea of how this organizing works, uh, in, a leader gets training, goes back to the village, say, has a community of women who want to close down the liquor shop because the liquor merchants are in fact providing a lot of additional alcohol to husbands uh, who, which is creating a lot of family violence, which is quite a common story, which I know Poonam can concur with me is a big problem. And, um, and so you get an organized group at the village level who is uh, going to sit there in front of that village liquor shop until it closes. And, and there's a long history of this kind of organizing in India, and in fact, you wouldn't believe it, but a lot of those liquor shops get closed down. Uh, and uh, liquor shops are usually the place where politicians go to use liquor in order to buy votes. So there's a, there's a very complex what one would say political nexus between uh, uh, the owners of liquor shops and uh, the political forces. So by closing down the liquor shops, many things get solved. Uh, so once the rural workers organize the one village and get one group of women organized, another youth is in another village trying to uh, stop a, an illegal mining in the forest area and that once you know if there's success that's that's great but even not those two struggles will eventually combine with a third and a fourth and a fifth struggle so that eventually you're building larger struggles on larger issues and this cycle of learning and social action and then coming back for more learning and building higher magnitudes of social action so that you move from the village to the tessel, to the sub-district levels, to the district, to the state province, to the national level, allows you to practice this nonviolent action. And it's, uh, the work that has been done in Ekta Parishad spans about 25 years of this kind of work and for uh, uh, it's been extremely effective because what it does is with semi-literate populations they can actually organize and they can actually practice this and they can actually learn about their land laws and so what you effectively have is that once you have a larger movement as we had say in 2007 you have a village woman who has grade two education who is leading the march to Delhi to tell the Prime Minister th the situation as she sees it not only in her village but in the larger geographical area within which she has become a leader. So this is the modus operandi of how uh, youth training and leadership development builds community action and mass movements. Um, 
the, uh, the role of women, uh, I need not say, is extremely important. 80% of the base is normally women. Uh, leaders coming up who are women are leaders of both women's groups as well as in the mixed movement of men and women. And women take on very unconventional roles. They, they uh, start to really uh, uh, grapple with uh, uh, large responsibility and in the process begin to overcome some of the barriers of patriarchal structures in which they're so deeply enmeshed. Now, um, what is, uh, I think, important to draw attention to is that in this nonviolent training that people are, are, are getting, uh, there is an element of uh, internal strengthening as well. It is not just about tactics and strategies. And uh, Professor Heather Eaton, who is head of the conflict studies at St. Paul's University in Ottawa, who joined us in a number of trainings, has, has said, and I quote, the training, uh, like Ecta Parishad's, tra that training, like Ecta Parishad's, gives us insight into how to cultivate inter interiority. That it opens our awareness. It's a form of awakening, becoming aware of levels of reality and resistance that we did not see before. In my experience, it awakens us to a reverence, a reverence that is very powerful. Gandhian movements such as Ekta Parishad infuse all our political activities and all our relationships with a genuine energy and awareness. And I think if you see the marches of, uh, as you saw in the film and participate in them, the energy of the people, of the singing, of the dancing, of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the kind of um, uh, sense of their own empowerment is, is, quite, uh, is quite significant. Um, I, I want to say in, in terms of the shrinking space in which, um, you know, I think we find in many countries that there's a shrinking amount of state, uh, space for the human rights defenders and human rights activists. And uh, I th one of the ways that I think uh, this has been sustained is by the mobilization dialogue process so that the government uh, realizes you're open to a dialogue, you're not trying to win political power, at the same time they understand you can get 25,000 people to march to Delhi or 50,000 people and it provides enough pressure that they have no option but to keep this to, that, to, to talk to you and that effectively uh, continues to open spaces. Um, the um, Gunsham Shah, who is one of our anthologists or sociologists in India, a very well-known uh, writer on Indian social movements, says something very interesting about uh, these guys. He says, these non-Marxist contemporary social movements you know, they tend to criticize technological pro, uh, progress, they focus on decentralization, they enact participatory processes that are autonomy seeking, but they're very interesting, they're able to interact with public administration, present themselves as institutions of democracy from below and perform functions like Rep uh, asking representative institutions like the judiciary to be uh, to be uh, in um, uh, uh, in in their courts and to act as counter experts and to re and to receive legal recognition for doing this. I think a well known Indian social movement that grew up in the late 1980s and 1990s, Narmada Bachchan and Dolan, uh, save the Nar Narmada Dam movement, which is extremely well known, I think, to anyone who has studied, uh, studied social movements in India or social movements generally. They framed their critique as uh, uh, anti-dam, anti or uh, that uh, dams were destroying the local livelihood rights by uh, 
um, by uh, 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 huge uh, networks of dams and they worked a lot uh, with the courts and jurisdiction on not only the right to development but uh, the right to development where there was uh, ongoing environmental sustainability. The, uh, uh, the, the recent anti-corruption movements uh, of 2011, which were, which were uh, well uh, televised here and, and were uh, significant in terms of uh, 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 political movement, uh, which later uh, uh, members of it uh, started a political party and in fact uh, now have, uh, have, have become uh, one of the leaders of the anti-corruption movement is now the chief minister or premier of the Delhi state. So uh, the, this type of social movement, unlike uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, ones that are not looking to win political power, have in fact helped uh, uh, create uh, less space for those social movements because the government is very suspect uh, of all social movements. So it was in, within that climate that this march took place. So the leaders were able to sustain nonviolence even uh, uh, if uh, political space was shrinking. Before I uh, 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 turn to the final question, I just want to say that the leadership of women within this movement, uh, as mentioned, uh, was quite uh, uh, significant in that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, when women go back to the villages after actions like this, they are incredibly empowered to take on uh, many, many uh, actions. And although some of them even leave the movement, many of them have become national leaders in the country. Uh, the the nonviolence uh, 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 that I want to turn to now as a political uh, culture, uh, do people really believe that nonviolence as a political culture can be achieved, or is nonviolence merely uh, tactics? I think um, I'd just like to say that while the Jan Satyagraha march was going on, there was many, many European solidarity actions. And they were one of them, the UK one, called themselves People March for Justice. And what I, I think is really interesting is that the march that you saw here, the Jan Satyagraha march, what makes it so different from a march for justice, say, in the UK, is that the March for Justice in the UK is claiming human rights within a legalistic framework. Um, but what this march is drawing on is really two major elements uh, that came from Gandhi. One is non-cooperation and, uh, and the other is mass mobilization. So uh, Gandhi, uh, I think the blending of these two is what makes it extremely powerful. Uh, one can say that non-cooperation began when Gandhi was thrown off the train at Peter's Maritzburg in South Africa after refusing to move from his first class compartment. The discrimination against colored people then got enacted in the 1906 black laws where restrictive uh, rules were imposed on Indian immigrants under the British colonial government. Now Gandhi was a lawyer in South Africa at that time and used legal means, but he also uh, began to use non-cooperation. The methods that he began in South Africa, he brought back to uh, India in 1915. And if you Fast forward to the SALT march, I think is quite well known to many of you in the 1930s, you'll see how he took this non-cooperation uh, set of uh, methods and, and really uh, brought it together with mass mobilization. Gandhi's SALT Satyagraha in 1930 was a march of 24 days. It was 390 kilometers from Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad to the to Dandi on the Gujarat coast, and it was to oppose British production and taxation of salt. 
there was a, a, a mass collection of sea salt to show the British government that they didn't need their salt, that we can, make, we can get our own salt. And Gandhi was arrested, and what happened thereafter, which is often not known, is that 2,700 people stayed behind in Darasana, Darsana, which is a coastal town near uh, Dandi in coastal Gujarat, where uh, salt is mined, was mined by the British. Now, people uh, went on a protest in front of these salt mines, and the British army beat these people with steel rods, uh, killing four people, and hundreds of people were sustained uh, injuries. It was this action, and not actually the march itself, that has led a number of authors to say that this was the beginning of the end of British colonial rule in India. But our story is that non-cooperation got combined with mass mobilization. Gandhi's Satyagraha, uh, notion of Satyagraha, Satyagraha means uh, uh, truth force, the force of a conviction for fighting or struggling for the truth. Uh, and uh, uh, Raghavan Iyer, who's a very well-known uh, uh, writer, a philosopher uh, of Gandhi, said that Satyagraha was, had a few elements to it. It was maintaining courage in the face of oppression. It was seeking reconciliation with rather than defeat of one's opponents. It was attacking oppressive systems instead of oppressors. It was accepting self-suffering without causing harm to others. It was rejecting physical means of violence and retaining hope that social justice would be, res would be the result. Now, Satyagraha, if you analyze it, is based on a Hindu tradition of abstinence. And, you know, uh, one can say a lot about that, but I think what's interesting is Richard Sarabji, who is uh, an Oxford scholar, I believe he's a classicist, compares uh, 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 this uh, Satyagraha with some of the Stoic and Christian traditions. He's recently written a book called The Stoics and Gandhi. And uh, he, he, he brings to light how political abstinence was used as a political tool. Ramin Jahan Beglu, who is currently a professor at York University, uh, an Islamic scholar, but someone very interested in seeing Gandhi uh, 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 and Gandhian nonviolence uh, uh, being taken uh, two uh, discourses uh, among Islamic scholars, uh, brings to light uh, uh, in his 2013 publication, The Gandhian Moment, that in fact much of um, uh, 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 Gandhi w uh, was, in w was influenced uh, by Thoreau's essay on duty of civil disobedience. Now, um, believes that Gandhi's views on violent and unsalutary state that forces the individual to return to his or her own conscience is, uh, is uh, the result. Now one could cite uh, many influences on Gandhi, you know, John Ruskin until the last, who shaped Gandhi's notion of the last person, the last woman or man who was the poorest of the poor. Uh, which was known as Gandhi's talisman and named as the Ant Antudaya. This uh, was a big influence. Leo Tolstoy, uh, The Kingdom of God Within You, uh, gave an ethical basis to Gandhi, which got brought into his formulation of what Satyagraha was. I think all of these influences were extremely important. Uh, Ruskin, Tolstoy, uh, Thoreau. Um, the interesting thing that I, uh, the interesting point that I want to make about Satyagraha, this sense of truth force, this conviction, inner conviction, uh, uh, that I will uh, follow my conscience and uh, and fight state injustice uh, through non-cooperation. Uh, was can be said to be grafted onto 
uh, his larger notion of nonviolence or non-oppositional politics. I think according to the Indian social thinker Ashish Nandi, who many of you may know, he's a very prolific and controversial uh, social thinker, says that Gandhi was a critical traditionalist and did not pretend to subscribe to Western scientific thought. He was looking for non-scientific rationality that corresponded with some of the civilizational values of India as presented through the classical texts of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, I think Gandhi was open to opposing viewpoints because he did not see the value of negating the opposite. This was because his notion of emancipation had more to do with achieving or overreaching one's limits than it did about becoming free of the fear of pain or death. This line of argument was strongly rejected by many uh, scholars of the Dalit movement in India that followed Ambedkar because they saw Gandhi's notion of emancipation as another form of high caste oppression. But Gandhi was always open to questioning his beliefs. He was a Jain who believed in Anakantavada, which is a doctrine of non-exclusivity that indicated that all truths are relative because human beings only have the capacity to know the conditioned or partial truth and not the whole truth. So respecting other viewpoints is not finding compromise. And I think this is extremely uh, important because it distinguishes Gandhian Sityagraha and Gandhian nonviolent action from uh, uh, reducing conflicts uh, generally as we see it here. That it's not finding a compromise between competing ideas, it's about finding the hidden elements of shared truth between ideas. Now nonviolence uh, uh, for Gandhi uh, uh, was uh, equivalent to truth and and so one has a lot to say about it but I think I just want to bring it to closure by saying these ideas had a lot of impact on movements like Ekta Parishad and many other movements in India over the last uh, uh, 60, 68 years. The this notion of the physical self-suffering that we saw of the marchers in the Jan Satyagraha march, this fight against injustice, this emphasis on dialogue, this sense that the power is with the poor and that's central, putting the antudaya, the last person, the last man, woman, in the forefront of the struggle. These are very key concepts that Gandhi uh, brought. Um, and I think many of the Indian state leaders have been influenced, no matter what political party, no matter how much they, they'll deny any uh, uh, relationship to Gandhi. I think politics is heavily transacted uh, from a Gandhian nonviolent framework because the generation that is ruling is still the generation that came through that freedom struggle. This has a shared meaning, this, this sense of nonviolence and Satyagraha has a shared meaning that goes, goes back into people's memories of the freedom struggle. And it therefore imbues Indian politics in a very strange way, but with some sort of political culture that still relates to this. And of course, movements like Ekta Parishad try to distinguish this political culture of nonviolence very clearly through emotional experiences, through cultural idiom, through their ideology, through the way their organizational structures are operating. Now, although uh, you know, uh, uh, we can say that uh, India is by far uh, it is not a nonviolent state. Uh, nonviolent political action is still part of the lexicon of Indian politics. In conclusion, then, Ekta Parishad has achieved, uh, has not achieved full land distribution to the 50,000 people that have marched. 
but it has worked incrementally to open up spaces for dialogue and it has created a sense that the power of the poor is the power uh, that needs to be defended. After uh, uh, seeing uh, what the outcome is, uh, you know, I know that it will have a huge impact on whether nonviolence and social actions will expand in a big way in future. But just to, to say that uh, there have been, through this nonviolent action, many people who have been empowered, and they now have a tool that they can use. And with that tool, it provides some hope that otherwise they would not have. I conclude my speech. Thank you.